Oh, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'm guessing you're probably from maybe 2049, 2050. Is, am I close? Um, yeah, let's say, let's say 2020, let's say 2025. Uh, let's, oh, let's I go. like that. that. That's even better. Oh, that's even <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is Chairman and Co-Chief Investment Officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another episode of Infinite Loops. And today I cannot tell you how excited I am to have Sahil Lavinga, founder and CEO of Gumroad, author of The Minimalist Entrepreneur. And honestly, I said to him beforehand, so I'm going to say it to you so you know I said it. Uh, I asked him, Sahil, are you either from the future? Uh, a Taoist sage or a Bodhisattva, and he was very modest and uh, said uh, he he did hedge on the from the future thing. Sahil, welcome. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. Excited to to be be here in 2021. So, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, I'm guessing you're probably from maybe 2049, 2050. Is am I close? Um, yeah, let's say, let's say 2020, let's say 2025. Uh, let's, oh, let's I like that. that. That's even better. Oh, <laughs> that, that is even better. Well, you know, as I was reading your book and reading about you, I mean, you literally personify for me, the way I see things going, we're actually doing a series on it called uh, the great reshuffle. Um, and you just got there 10 years ahead of everybody else. And so what I'd like you to start out with is just telling your story, because when I was reading it, it kind of reads like a novel, honestly. It's like, I'm, I'm working on trying to figure out this pencil icon on a Friday night. I can't figure it out. And so you think, boy, if I, have a, if I had a file for this, I, I, I could do this so easily, but you're going to tell it so much better than I do. So if you'd, if you'd tell us that beginning story. Totally. Yeah, so I started Gumroad. I was I was uh, fully employed at the time at Pinterest, where I had joined as employee number two and and was in charge of Pinterest for iPhone. So I was kind of the first designer, second engineer at Pinterest. I kind of took a leave of absence from USC as a freshman to join them. So I was still very kind of early in my career, and I was it was the first time I'd ever lived in the Bay Area before, which as a kid growing up in Singapore, like was like shocking to me that you could walk outside and people around would know what startups and venture capital and Y Combinator and Paul Graham, like it's just amazing. So I would basically spend every weekend either building something new or going to a coffee shop and trying to meet and kind of network with, you know, other people in the, in the industry. And one weekend, one Friday night, I was at home and I had an idea for a Mac app and I basically wanted, I'll tell you the problem. The problem I had was I would constantly copy paste things. And I don't know if you've ever had this, but you would copy paste one thing, then you have to go back, copy paste the second thing, go back, go back. And what I wanted to do is copy paste one, two, three, you know, copy, 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 and then paste, 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 paste. Yeah. So I wanted to make an app that would basically allow you to have these multiple copy paste boards, which now exists. Um, but anyway, I needed an icon. So I designed this photorealistic pencil icon and 
I basically just found a bunch of tutorials online. And at the end of four hours, I had this beautiful photorealistic pencil icon. And for whatever reason, my reaction was like, man, I wish I had this thing four hours ago, you know, like a source file or some equivalent, it would have taken me 15 minutes or 30 minutes or something like that to figure out, wait a second. Like that's, that's a lot of time. Like I'm willing, I would, I would pay money to save myself time. And so, you know, I had the source file. I felt like, okay, if I wanted something like this four hours ago, there must be someone else who's like four hours later in their journey of icon design or something like that. And so I tried and had a really hard time selling a single thing on the internet, which was just kind of surprising to me because if I wanted to give it away for free, right, you could put it, there's like 50 places you can put on Dropbox, you can email it, you can put on Twitter, YouTube, whatever. Like there's a million places you can host free stuff on the internet and it's all kind of paid for via advertising. But if I wanted to sell the thing, even for a dollar, it was like virtually impossible, um, which I felt was very strange because at the same time, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, Reddit, Twitter, like all of these platforms were basically bringing all of these people into the internet. You know, all these people were building audiences and I assumed would need to sell stuff quite quickly. And there was no easy way for, to kind of do that. And so I pinged a friend, John from Stripe and said, Hey, could I use this? Uh, they, they had yet to launch. Uh, could I use Stripe and build like this MVP, basically bit.ly plus a credit card form. And spent the weekend building Gumroad and ended up launching it Monday morning. Uh, okay, and- I, I, I just have to interject here. Yeah. You figured it out over the weekend and then you launched on Monday morning. Yep, yeah, before, <laughs> my, before my day job, I guess at Pinterest. So I had to launch it at like six, seven in the morning and it reached the top of Hacker News and it, you know, kind of the rest, the rest is history. But yeah, I've always, and this is, you know, something I talk about in the book, but just generally I, I feel very strongly about, which is the best ideas you can build in a weekend. Obviously, Uber, Facebook, you know, it takes a decade to, to get to where they are today. But the crux of the idea, right, like the Facebook wall, you know, or, or profile picture album or the Uber call a cab. I actually built the first thing. One of the first things I ever built was a, an app called Taxi Law, which was an app I, I grew up in Singapore, as I mentioned, was an app that allowed you to call a cab from your phone. Mm-hmm. Uh and so, yeah, it took a weekend, you know? And so I always, I, I really, you know, Twitter, people would joke about this, right? Because Twitter was one of the first kind of web 2.0 startups and raised gobs of money. And, you know, people would deride it as like, I could build this in a weekend. Like, why is this worth hundreds of millions? Obviously the, the value is not on the software, it's in the network effects, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I, I just feel, feel really strongly about the fact that like a lot of ideas, you should be able to at least get a proof of concept going in a weekend. And the weekend constraint, forces you to actually pare down what you're building, right? Because otherwise you you end up spending all your time saying, oh, I need this and I need this and we need that part. And um, many of those things you don't actually need. Um, you want, right? You want them, um, but you don't need them. And so I, I find that the weekend kind of constraint is just super helpful for me to, to say, okay, what, instead of thinking about what do I need to ship, it's like, what can I ship in a weekend, right? Um, and I find that that's generally enough to, to kind of test the waters and, and get a sense from the market, you know, cause ultimately what you really want is like market feedback, right? Um, that's, that's ultimately what, what kind of leads the way to the, to the future is, is just reacting to the market and, 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 you know, learning trial, we're learning by kind of by fire, right? Trial by fire. Yeah. And we're going to get into that much more deeply when we talk about your book, which I think is fantastic. Um, but so you, you built no storefront, no complicated setup. You had one link, uh, you were going to, you know, kind of Craigslist the thing and uh, learn from what the market would want it. Wanted. But I love this part because you did something that I did. And that is you had all of these kind of principles, right, that you wanted to instill in Gumroad. But then you admit we didn't do it that way. We went out and we raised a bunch of VC money. Uh, we wanted to be first mover, which I personally, you're going to be much more versed in this than me. I think it's a myth, the whole far, first mover thing. Uh, but you, you, you went the VC route, you went the all-star team route, you wanted to ship fast, and then you learned a lot, which ultimately came to your book. Can, let, talk, tell me about that. Yeah. So I, I launched, you know, Gumroad that Monday morning and had kind of basically spent the next few months still working at Pinterest and kind of hacking on different side projects uh, and eventually just realized uh, that I wanted to focus on Gumroad as, you know, as a, as a company, not just as a project. And the reason was kind of twofold. One, you know, one was that I had 
left college to go to Pinterest because I wanted to see if startups were really what I wanted to do. And ultimately, the way that I saw my career going into school was I, you know, spend four years getting a degree, then I go work at Google for 10 years, then I work at a smaller startup, and eventually, like, I start my own thing. And that would take, you know, at 35 or something like that. And I had this opportunity, like, at 18, 19 years old to start a company and raise money from investors. Um, and so like, why wait 15 years to know if this is the right thing for me, if I could do it today. And I did give up a lot of sort of stock options at Pinterest, uh, to do that. Uh, but it felt like kind of, it, it's, it's incomparable, right? Even being employee number one to being the person that is fully at fault if things don't, you know, like you can't, you have to answer the phone sort of thing. Right. Um, which is very appealing to me. And then just the learning opportunity of it, right? Like just the amount of learning. And this is one thing that I, I do think that the people on the more bootstrap side of the aisle miss is that when you raise money and you build an amazing team, like your ability, your, your learning by osmosis, like it's just so unfair. Like, it's like, instead of like going to school, you know, at the best engineering school, I can hire the best engineer from that engineering school and basically like learn from them, right? Like every day I get to like read all this amazing code and design and like learn and improve. And uh, it's it's just absolutely awesome. Um, pretty similar to the reasons I, I became kind of an investor. But yeah, so I, I, I left Pinterest in uh, August and raised a $1.1 million seed round from a bunch of folks, Max Levchin, Chris Saka, first round, Excel, lowercase, I guess I said that, uh, collaborative fund, uh, Danny Reimer, uh, Naval from AngelList, and then raised a series A like three or four months later from Kleiner Perkins and Mike Abbott joined the board. So we raised around $8 million or so in total, uh, and then just started hiring like crazy and did the thing that, you know, everyone does in Silicon Valley, right? Which is used to be untraditional. Now it's kind of like traditional. It's kind of the cargo cult thing to do, which is you get an office in Soma, you hire a bunch of people, you know, primarily engineers and designers and product people, you ship, you talk to customers, you sell, you market, you do this over and over again. You hope that your kind of growth curve goes up and to the right. And it did for Gumroad. Like it was definitely up and to the right. And I felt like that was great. And fast forward sort of three years later in late 2014, I started talking to investors about the Series B, right? The kind of the next big round of funding. And I felt like, okay, the creator economy is starting to hit its stride. It wasn't really what people refer to it as, but it was starting to happen. Patreon had launched, Teachable had launched, and we were the first. And we went out to raise a, a, a round. I started talking to investors, and the feedback I got from the market was, you're not growing fast enough. Like, you have this interesting idea. You made a bet on this kind of this thesis that all these people, all these creators now would join sort of the online economy and need ways to sell without a storefront, and Gumroad would be, kind of be the, the default. And for many kind of, kind of reasons, the the set of assumptions that we made didn't play out the way that we thought they would. Um, and so, you know, met with hundreds of investors, which you can do when Kleiner leads the A and basically got as many no's as that, right? Like got no, no yeses and ended up shrinking the team down to get to profitability so that we could continue serving our customers, our creators, you know, they were making two, two, two and a half million dollars a month. And I didn't feel like if I sold the business to like Patreon or Square or Medium or some of the other businesses we were talking to that I could, can, you know, I could convincingly say that Gumroad would, would be around in a year or two. The only way to ensure that Gumroad could be around in a year or two was to basically shrink the company. We went from 20 employees down to five, and then eventually from five down to one, just me, um, and get to profitable. And, you know, if it's profitable and I run the business, like I know I can keep it around. Right. Um, and so that's kind of the dramatic kind of, uh, undoing of, of the company. Um, and then I basically ran it by myself for a couple of years kind of did the Tim Ferriss four hour work week, took that book more literally than maybe he intended. And when I started growing back the company again, hired amazing people like Vatsal and, and other folks to kind of chip in instead of be, you know, full-time employees of the company, kind of think about the unbundling of work per se. And that's how we run government today. We have 40 people. We're at like 11 million in annualized revenue. We just raised a crowdfunding round, 5 million at hundred million pre-money valuation from Naval, Jason Fried and a bunch, you know, 7,000 actually other indiv individual investors. So yeah, I mean, just, just kind of, I would say the old path, the sort of 2011 to 2015 Gumroad was kind of like the startup path, right? Just like the blitz scaling zero to one, that whole mental model, right? And big fans of a lot of those, those things. And then the sort of, 2016 onwards has been kind of like first principles thinking like what does the future look like you know i don't have a board anymore i don't have a team anymore i'm really really starting from scratch in almost every way like what 
kind of business do I want to run? And, and when I did, you know, when I was growing Gumroad kind of as a as sort of a Phoenix, um, I was living in Provo, Utah at the time. So kind of culturally, like a very, very different place from San Francisco. And so I, I felt like I was able to, I, it was easier for me to kind of think from first principles without kind of the the kind of, you know, reality distortion field of society saying, hey, no, this is, that's not how you run a business. You need employees, you need to give equity, you need to do things in this sort of, this sort of way. Yeah, Batsel, you you had a good question and I think fits right in here. Yeah, so I, so even in the book, uh, The Minimalist Entrepreneur, I think it's in the introduction itself where you mentioned that when you move from Silicon Valley to Utah, there was this shift in perspective of, what success actually is. In Silicon Valley, success is building a billion dollar business, having a bunch of hotshot VCs in your cap table and that kind of stuff. While in Utah, it was having a happy family, a sustainable business, going to the church, that kind of stuff. And, and I'm wondering now that we are transitioning into a world where online communities are much more prevalent than physical communities and you don't really have to move your entire life to be part of a different community, different idea. You can just join, log into those communities from wherever you are. I'm thinking if the effect of online communities on how you look at world, how you look at things and uh, the, that shift in perspective, can that be as impactful and long lasting as what a physical community does? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I often, you know, sort of first principles basis, like I, I believe that, you know, the only real constraints on what we get to build is, you know, the kind of like the laws of physics, right? Like anything beyond that, we, that that's sort of our playground as humans, like any, you know, that's, those are the bounds. And so I think so, right? Like, I think ultimately, we will get to a place in which there is no real distinction between the metaverse and the universe, right? Like, the, they are really the same the same sort of thing. Um, I don't think we're there yet, right? And I actually had a great phone call with someone yesterday who's a pseudonymous entrepreneur in, in kind of Web3. Um, I don't know his name, uh, know where he lives by city, uh, that's about it. Um, and he, he made some really interesting points. Uh, one is that you, you need to port your, you, you, need, you need to build a reputation somehow, right? Like ultimately you need real, you know, what Nassim Taleb calls skin in the game, right? Um, and that's, a lot easier in, in the real world, right? Like I remember like a lot of, when I moved to Provo, Utah, like a lot of the conversations I had with people were very uncomfortable, right? Like things about gun control or like abortion or something like that. And, and to, a, to a point where like, I knew if I had this conversation over Zoom or on the phone or certainly over DMs on Twitter or something like that, I would just exit, right? I would just leave the conversation because I didn't have enough at stake there. And I didn't really care about the other person on the other side. But when you have, when you're in person, I think you're just more willing to kind of have a lot of those conversations in a way that, you know, it's, it's kind of high activation energy to get into, but that also means you're more likely to stay because it's kind of equivalent high energy to kind of leave the system. Right. Um, a friend of mine says like, you know, people, people are a lot smarter when, when there's the threat of, of being, be, being able to be punched in the face, right? Like you're lots, you, you generally carry yourself a little bit better, um, you know, I mean, Mike Tyson said something similar like that. Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. it's uh, maybe it's Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth or something, right? Um, similar, yeah, similar thing. Um, so I don't think we're there yet. I'm not sort of as as far as biology in the sense that like you can totally do this from scratch. And I often think about like did the the 17 year old Sahil who decided to move to California because that's where all the startups were, you know, from Singapore. Like, would I have done that in 2021? Right. I think the answer is still yes. I would move somewhere in the U.S. I think that there's still so much privilege that, that that living in America gets you that I would probably still do that. Uh, but certainly like it's becoming less and less important, right? And and depending on the industry, I think it's like, for example, if you're building a B2B SaaS startup, I still think it makes a lot of sense to be in the Bay Area or near the Bay Area because that's where so much of your customers ultimately are. And, you know, often it's not up to you, the future, like it's a collective decision we all have to make together. So even if you want to live in the future, it's like, well, cool, you know, like the, like this guy mentioned, like I want to be fully crypto native, but ultimately like I have to pay rent, right? Like I have to live somewhere. And that means that I have to pull money out of Web3, crypto, Bitcoin, et cetera, and like turn it into US dollars so I can, you know, my I can't buy a burger with with Bitcoin yet, right? And so there, there is sort of like the, 
practicality of it versus the, you know, and I, and I really believe in, you know, in, in this sort of the, the, the ends justify the means kind of the, the, I'd rather make progress than be right. Right. If I, I could go to the rooftop and say, this is the way everyone should live and be very right about that. But if that means that nobody votes the way that I want them to vote and I ultimately lose every single election and they get their way, then what's the point, right? Like, do I care more about being right or do I care about actually making positive progress? And this is something I learned when I moved from San Francisco to Provo, Utah, as I realized that not, you know, even at the beginning, it wasn't really like, oh, it wasn't like, oh, am I right or wrong about these issues? It's more like, how do we win? Even if the liberals are right on every single issue, we clearly lost. (laughs) So just strategically, I think we should be a little bit more open-minded about, even if we think the the, the right or whoever is on the other side is totally wrong on every issue, they won. So we have to, you know, if we care about progress, and I, I remember someone telling me this about feedback and, you know, which is, I think one of the hardest things to learn as a, as a new CEO is giving positive and negative critical feedback. And they said, they framed it really well for me, which was like, there's basically two reasons to give someone feedback. One is to make them feel bad. Right. And, and then the other is to, is so that they improve. But if they're, if your goal, and hopefully you're not giving feedback for them to improve, you're giving, or, you know, to cut them down, you're giving them feedback because you want them to improve. But ultimately you measure that not by the quality of your feedback, you measure it by, well, did they improve or not, right? Like it doesn't matter how good your feedback is. And often I'm sure everyone listening has experienced this where you really want to give someone feedback. It's the right kind of feedback. You're doing it because you really believe that they will improve if they listen to it, but they're just not open to it at that point, right? And so there's also that sort of pragmatism there where you're like, ultimately, what do you care most about? And I really care about real manifestations of change, not just, wow, I have a bunch of really great ideas that people will, you know, retweet, right? No, I want people to actually improve the kind of the quality of the standard of living that they have. And I think that's really important to me. I could not agree with you more. I often say that Action without knowledge is foolish, but knowledge without action is futile. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, so you, what you want to do is take informed action. And I'm totally on board with your assessment of, do you, do you want to make something happen or do you want to be right? Um, like, uh, I, I'm stealing a line from Jed McKenna here, but uh, it would, the smartest decision I ever made was to stop being smart. And like, I, 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 always just naturally assume that any of my thesis or hypothesis, I'm going to get the null set. And so it's very, it's very easy for me to like, oh, that didn't work. Well, (laughs) let's try something else. And I, I have found, I work with a lot of people, Vatzel's age, but older people as well in both finance and tech. Um, And I, I'm flabbergasted by the amount of people that still want to be right. And mm-hmm. I, 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 I've gotten to the point, and Vatzel can definitely attest to this, where I, I have a hard time processing that. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, so you're right. I'll <laughs> say you're right. You're right. Okay, now let's move on. And, and, yeah. and, they'll, and they'll dig in and they'll just like, just be on it like a dog on a bone. And I'm like, you're not, you're not doing anything here except exhausting your mental and emotional energy. Yeah. Is that what you really want to do? I think the answer is to many people is yes. You know, I do think it's sort of like a different kind of sport uh, that has kind of developed in a way. Uh, Nate Friedman from, from, from GitHub had a great quote. He said, you know, pessimists sound smart. Yeah. Optimists make money, right? And <laughs> exactly. There's, there's definitely that sort of the cynicism, like you feel good because it, you like it, if you want to be right, you can just go to every single startup, every single new technology and say, it's going to fail. You will be right <laughs> 90% of the time. Like that's not hard to do. Uh, but if you want to be rich, then you, you have to be optimistic and right. Like you have to pick the right ones. And luckily those bets are kind of asymmetric. Um, I think Naval also like framed this really well with sort of wealth games versus status games. And I think until he's framed it like that, I never really thought about that because I've always been quite oriented toward wealth. Like, I think maybe it's, I don't know, son of immigrants or what have you, like sure. mon- money is fungible. Right. And, and, and so if I want anything else, I know I can always trade money to get it at some right. exchange rate. And so, you know, why not start with the kind of the universal currency of the world um, and, and kind of work from there. 
but I've I've learned over over the years uh, that holy crap, like not everyone thinks like this. Actually, many many people are incentivized by status, right? And what an amazing feeling because that means there's so much less competition, right? If everyone were truly trying to get rich, I guarantee you that these people are just as smart, just as hardworking. It's just that they have a totally different, as you said, like a, a different set of priorities. What do they really want? Um, and I was reading a Michael Crichton book, Disclosure, recently, which is phenomenal. He's and, a great writer. Yo, know, he's I so like, good. I love Michael Crichton. Yeah. He's Please so, continue. He's so good. And he he had a great line in there or one of his characters did which was basically like all human behavior is problem solving and i love thinking about that which is like instead of saying oh why that this person is stupid for doing this thing that i would never do it just really be like why are they doing this then right um i remember the 2016 election like the liberals would say wow like the right is voting against their best interests you know, because they were voting for all of these things that, you know, maybe like tax cuts and all these things that they, they wouldn't benefit from or whatever. Um, and then the right would say the exact same thing about the left. Be like, oh, well, they're they're voting against their own interests because they're voting for higher taxes on themselves. It was very strange. What I, like, And it's like they're both trying to like paint the other side as like more charitable, which is kind of interesting um, as, as kind of almost like a nag. Um, but I, I realized like, no, they're both self-interested and they're just both terrible at realizing that and like yeah. almost giving the other person credit They're like no they are actually doing what they want they're not being duped they they know what they're getting into they don't they're not going to regret this decision six months later because of russia or facebook or who knows what like these people are making decisions that they believe in uh for better or worse and you know it's important to acknowledge that you know and like just give them that like i think of it as, as just being respectful right like just like i would want them to respect the fact that i made I don't know, whatever decisions I made, you know, because I wanted to solve a problem that I truly had, like, I, I want to give them the same benefit of the doubt. Which, which is great. And it, it made me think about a podcast I did with a friend who uh, lives here in Manhattan. He's anonymous on Twitter. He's, an, he's a, a medical doctor, but he's an amazing entrepreneur. And like one of my other taglines often is, uh, you know, we are deterministic thinkers living in a probabilistic world. Uh, hilarity or tragedy often ensue. And so I got on with my first podcast with Max. That's not his name. Um, and, and, and he got after me about that. He's like, Jim, you don't want people to be probabilistic thinkers. You want them to be deterministic thinkers so that you're sitting like Hannibal up on your elephant and <laughs> gauging all of the probabilities. And, and, and so we had a fun exchange about it, but I really got like, I, I was obsessed with that thought for the rest of the day because I had never thought about it that way. If, if, if people who were long ball, which is me, I love being long ball. I, I literally don't understand people who don't want to be long ball. And yet 95% of the people want to short ball. They want to sell ball. And, and Max got me to understand that if that didn't exist, I don't exist. You don't <laughs> exist. Yeah. Bezos doesn't exist. Elon doesn't exist. Because if it was 50-50, there's a lot of smart people, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're, in my opinion, I put it off to the model that they're using just isn't the right one, or mm -hmm. at least from my point of view, it's not the right one. But like you, I, I came to the conclusion, well, fuck, I'm lucky. I mean, because yeah. if, if there were a bunch of other people who w were as risk seeking as I am and look at it as quite normal, by the way, um, I'd. I wouldn't be able, we, we have an amazingly efficient marketplace. Yeah, totally. No, you're totally right. I mean, I think of it like kind of like, you know, simple power law distribution, right? Like if in that world, the vast majority of people are kind of on the, on the tail of the curve, very, very mm -hmm. few people, you know, the Amazons and Teslas and Apples of the world are actually on that, the head. The crazy thing is that that head is by quantity, very small, but by kind of quality or magnitude is just like getting larger and larger and larger. And so the world tends to operate by those, those people setting the rules more and more and more. Um, and I think that's kind of underrated in this kind of the discourse is that like capitalism is a voting system, right? It's just a new kind of voting system. It actually has a lot more votes than democracy, American democracy does, right? Every single person participates 
virtually in, in, in sort of our capitalistic kind of economy. And I think that's one of the dissonances that we kind of have to figure out, right? Um, like, what do people want? How are they voting? And they're voting in many different ways. Um, but yeah, you're totally right. Like, I'm super long ball, right? Like, I, 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 I'm sort of a Nassim Taleb, you know, kind of person. But the vast majority of people are are not, right? And I, I remember actually, like, when I first started having any sort of disposable income and savings, the thing to do, which everyone told me to do, is like, just put, you know, S&P 500, ETFs, Vanguard, awesome, right? And I did that. And man, that was a dumb decision. <laughs> Like it did okay, but in hindsight, especially for the learning associated with it, what I should have done is like every month picked one stock and really built my mental model of, can I pick the head of the curve on this power law distribution, right? Um, and I have unique knowledge, specific knowledge that I've gained through experience that many people do not have. Uh, you know, I invested in Tesla, you know, at a $2 billion valuation because I knew who Elon Musk was. Like no sophistication as an investor, just knew his name. Why? Because I was in tech and I knew PayPal, right? Um, but those those things add up. I mean, those, those those things are incredibly unique data points that you have that most you know, most people don't. And I think it's really important to be like, what well, what are those? What are the what is my long vol, right? Like what what Peter Thiel says, right? Like what's the thing you believe that no you know most people don't believe, right? And make bets on that belief, right? Exactly. Actually, I would love if America could, in, in, you know adopt prediction markets for more things, right? I, I think that would be a, I think the sort of the price discovery of the market um, would be very useful if, if you believe that the, the sort of the future is, is probabilistic, uh, you know, it's it, like having more and more of these, these prediction markets, I think would be, would be really, really, really helpful. Um, and yeah, I, I remember talking to some, a friend and I, I noticed the deterministic mindset. And I think it, it I think it's like, human nature. I think you have to almost fight it to, to some level. Because, you know, for example, in today's world, you can't imagine that like Tesla and Amazon are not trillion dollar companies, right? Like that's just kind of assumed. But there's a very real kind of alternate reality in which like Tesla did not work. Uh, Amazon did not work, right? Um, and like some of these decisions were kind of hairpin just sort of decisions um, and outcomes. And, you know, like every startup has these stories where it's like, wow, if we didn't figure this thing out, we would be dead, but we put, you know, we put together the round um, and now we're, you know, you know, uh, a massive multi-billion dollar public company, right? Four, four years later. Um, but to the outside, it's like, of course, Tesla was going to be where it was today. It's just like, no, <laughs> um, well, we would have had something else because I do believe the laws of physics would lead to the electric car and all of these sorts of things. Um, but it might've been a totally different person, different company or same person, different kind like, I think it's impossible to really know is sort of unfalsifiable, the different, you can't A, B test reality, right? Like you kind of have one option um, and one planet, et cetera. So I remind myself of that pretty frequently. Like, it's so easy to say, oh, obviously Tesla is the next big thing or whatever, but it's not like, you know, and, and even, you know, if it's an 80% likelihood chance, like just like Hillary had an 83% likelihood chance of winning the election. Like, and everyone's surprised that she lost, but it's like, well, every, no one said hundred. <laughs> right. No, I mean, 80, you know, flip enough coins. That's a, that's not, uh, but you, you know, people just have this tendency to be like, there's no, I remember like with Trump, like there were all these things that were like, no one who's never received a major newspaper endorsement has become president. No one has like no one without experience in the legislative branch or military has won. And it's like all these things basically saying like this hasn't happened before. So it can't happen in the future. And it's like, have you not read Black Swan? Like, have you not 9-11? Actually, every single event ever is new at some point. Like it was the first time it had ever happened. And things are only getting crazier and crazier and crazier because of the Internet uh, and software and you know, all of these trends, right? Um, the volatility is only going to go up over time, uh, I believe. And uh, so you will have more and more, like the like the, the past almost matters less and less over time in, in a sense, right? It's like, oh, of course, like, yeah, it's like Trump had, didn't have any of these things, but also no one has ever won the election with 65 million people following them on Twitter, right? Like that's also a, fa a fact of the universe that is also new that we might want to incorporate <laughs> In, in our model, um, but we can't because there's no model, right? There's no real way to, um, right? It's kind of like the point of a model is just to know what assumptions you're making. It's not necessarily to, to rely on the model for, for everything that you do. 
uh, like I'm speechless because I, you just said like virtually everything I believe. <laughs> I, I think prediction markets are woefully underused. I think that we could maximize utility in this country enormously by having prediction markets for everything. Anyway, yeah. so like I totally agree with everything that, that you've just said there, which leads me to the book which I think is fabulous. And, you know, the, the whole idea behind like no meetings, no offices, um, this to me is the way that the future is going to be. You, you prioritize the creator, uh, not the shareholder. Uh, you, you know, you, you need to be distinctive. You need to be honest. You need to be transparent. These are all things that we do with OSAM. We're an asset management firm. Mm -hmm. um, but, so how is it being received? Uh, uh, how are people reacting? Yeah, I mean, I think generally people love the idea of it, right? Like it, 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 I think definitely people want it to happen. I think there's a lot of people saying, I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> so that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of, the, you know, you're going into the coal mine and, and, you know, we'll see if you live sort of thing. <laughs> you're uh, the canary. <laughs> So there's definitely that. And, you know, we got rid of our office in, in 2015, mostly because we had to, we were running out of money and the office was $25,000 a month in the center of San Francisco. And that was really kind of, yeah, done sort of forced upon us and then realized like, wow, without an office, then why do we have standard working hours? Like if no one's showing up anywhere. And if we don't have those, then like, why don't we allow anyone to work anywhere in the world? And if we have that, then we certainly can't have meetings because someone's going to be asleep. And it kind of was like a very graduated thing. And then obviously 2020 happened and everyone was kind of forced to adopt some of the, you know, and we actually, I remember in March of 2020, literally no changes happened at Gumroad. Like we had no, like nothing. Like we'd already worked in this way. Um, we already had no meetings, no deadlines. We already had a bunch of part-time people all over the world, like no change whatsoever. Um, and that's one of, that was one of the moments I think I often think about, which is, are you kind of correct on accident, right? Like you should lean into that. Like, for example, I got into iPhone apps because I thought it was really fun. And then the iPhone became really, really important. And I happened to be at the right place at the right time, which I kind of like to credit to my kind of subconscious. Like what was I wanting to do that got me into the right place at the right time uh, to take advantage of this wave, you know, without even knowing that this really paying attention to, you know, trying to make a bunch of money or, or whatever it may, it may be. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think generally people are excited about the way that we work there. It's definitely early. Um, I kind of consider it kind of like the web 2.1 way of working, yeah. which you have kind of the traditional way. And then you have like kind of the crypto web three way, which is like pseudonymous DAOs, you know, liquidity, instant liquidity, super transparent, open source, et cetera. And I think that's all awesome, but I think it's sort of going to be quite a while until the rest of the world is on chain, quote unquote, what I think is more likely is that companies like Gumroad will adopt many of those ways of working. And it's going to happen a lot faster than people think, right? And part of, partly it's the feedback loop between the companies that work like this and the tooling that exists to allow those companies to work better, right? Because the more companies that work like this, the more of a market there is to actually build software and kind of an industry, right? Like just like Stripe enabled a lot more businesses to form, but Stripe's existence was only possible because all of these startups were starting to exist and then vice versa like stripe existing now makes it easier for more people to build businesses that gives more cash flow to stripe to do more and more and more and it's kind of this nice feedback loop and i think you see this these all over the place um so i'm hopeful that government will kind of create more of a market opportunity and actually one of the projects we have internally is figuring out can we play in this can we build our own set of tooling that we can kind of you know a new product effectively to allow companies to adopt the way that we work uh, more readily, more easily. Um, it's still very early. Um, there's probably five or 10 companies that I think have sort of really worked this way at scale. But I, I take a lot of, I don't know, I have a lot of hope because, you know, if you said in 2019 that like you could have a publicly listed company with no office or no headquarters, right? It, it would have been impossible. I don't think there was ever an example of one, right? You needed some mailbox somewhere. And then Coinbase listed, right? And they, I think, were the first to say, we don't have an HQ. Um, and then that was crazy and a big deal. And then GitLab went public and they don't even have an office. Like they literally are 100%. I think they have 1100 or something employees and they're fully remote. And it's sort of like, 
the, the it's you know this is what i love about capitalism right it's like you can convince people by just winning right yep. like ultimately no one's going to get convinced by a nice beautiful wired article or atlantic article or harvard business review you know thought piece right what what ends up convincing someone is holy crap tesla is tesla and i want to invest in tesla and unfortunately it's all in, you know, you're, you, you get that it's a package deal, right? You, you, you sign up for it or you don't, uh, you're voting for this way of working, whether you like it or not, you know, and, and I think that's seeing Coinbase, seeing GitLab, and I think a lot more companies in the coming years work this way, I think is going to be very, very, very interesting. And though the jury is still out, like the way that I think about it is that we've had kind of co-located work for, let's say 150, 200 years or something like that, right? With kind of industrial factories. And, and before that, everyone was working from home, I guess. Um, and we've had real full remote work for like two years, you know? So like if you're comparing and, and already, I think we're pretty competitive. Right. And so imagine five to 10 years from now when you have, you know, like we're, we're kind of where the iPhone came out where we're like, you know, the app store just came out, the iPhone just got copy and paste, right? Like we're still there in terms of remote work, asynchronousity, even when I think about Gumroad, the way that we work today would not have been possible three or four years ago, right? Because tools like Notion, GitHub is, has radically increased, Figma, which is phenomenal, Slack is getting better, like all of the, and all of these things kind of compound, right? And so we're kind of making a bet on the, not just on Gumroad, but on the kind of the infrastructure that we get to use. Um, and, you know, we literally, like I wake up every day, I'm like, oh, wow, working at Gumroad is now, you know, cheaper because Amazon lowered our pricing on their cloud stuff over here or faster because Figma now has this feature that lets us do this in a minute instead of 10 minutes. And if you're using the old system, you don't get any of those benefits, right? Like you, you, you think you're, you're doing better because you're on kind of like the cruise ship, but you don't realize that like, you know, you're not on the speedboat that's like all the way over there. Um, and you can't easily make the switch. You kind of have to do that kind of like go dip back down the mountain to start climbing this new mountain. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I often, I often, yeah, think the, I think web web 2.1 is like a good kind of good framing. And, and also it's like, there's a great book, I think it's called the, the Cathedral and the Bazaar, which is about kind of the origin of Linux and the open source movement. And it was kind of this similar chaos. And people were like, there's no way you can make any, any good software this way. It needs this kind of top-down planning, you know, visionary, product visionary at the top, uh, sort of Steve Jobs, Ian figure. Uh, but it's like, you know, like there's plenty of evidence that like, you know, humans, why do we exist? It's not because someone ordained us to exist. It's because evolution is crazy and like, you know, a ton of trial and error. And it's a very bottoms up sort of, you know, way of, of doing things, right. It's kind of like over proliferation and, and, uh, and you kind of go down the longest chain, right. In a sense, like very, a lot of similarities actually to kind of like the blockchain in that way. But, uh, so obviously it works, like obviously the bottoms up you know, kind of approach works. It's a lot more chaotic. There's a lot more madness. There's a lot more failure maybe potentially, but I do think the ultimately some of the strongest ideas are this, these kind of happy accidents that kind of compound into each other. Um, and so that's kind of the experiment we're running. It's like, can we build a company of effectively like mini CEOs where they're kind of dictating what they think is the best thing to do? And then me, I'm really, honestly, I'm just a capital allocator, right? Like all I'm doing is raising money either from, you know, the product revenues or, raising external capital and then investing in people, right? Hiring people, investing in them. Um, and I, I, I really, I mean, like, I really believe quite strongly in like Bezos and Elon are like really more capital allocators than anything else. They're really e able to say, this is a massive opportunity and I can rally the troops and capital meaning people. It means social capital now, especially with Elon, like all these different kinds of forms of capital and leverage and pointing them at the right problem at the right time, right? Like this is the 10 year frame in which this thing is going to happen. Um, and obviously they get it wrong all the time, right? Like the, the fire phone or whatever was like, I don't know, a multi-billion dollar failure. Um, but I love what Bezos said about it. He's like, you know, what would be scarier is if we didn't have any multi-billion dollar failures, because it would mean right. that we're not taking the risks, right? You have to fail. Um, if you're not failing, you're, yeah, you're, you're, there's, you need the, you know, you want some of those kind of false negatives in a, in a way or false positives, right? You, you, you want to be taking those kinds of risks and, and building a diversified portfolio, right? In, within the company, I would say, not just as a human, as an investor, but, but be, being able to take those risks is I think really, really, really important. Um, and I always optimize for that. I always, I would always rather take the, do the weird new thing 
and and have the potential of working, then back away from that, right? And I think that takes a culture of people who are wanting to work at government because they know I'm going to lean into these kinds of things, right? Like, why would I do a $5 million crowdfunding round, do be super transparent, do board meetings on YouTube? I don't know. I'm just trying to increase the kind of serendipitous nature of these happy accidents, right? Um, and I see that all the time. Like I look back at Gumroad, I'm like, wow, if we didn't hire this one person, Gumroad would be totally different today, right? And it, a lot of it, it comes down to kind of like the the Harry Sheldon kind of Sheldon crises, right? And being prepared with the right kind of people. And I'm sure things would have been fine in some different path, but we would have ended up, you know, in a very, very different place, right? Um, so yeah, anyway. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I would I would guess that you're a fan of David Deutsch's The Beginning of Infinity. Oh, because huge. yeah, huge. as as am I. And like I just try I proselytize about that endlessly. And most of the time you can tell by looking at Vatzel, he's like, oh God, here we go again. But the idea of he has like three critical things that really changed the way I looked at the world. Uh, the first is that um, we believe that we know everything now, <laughs> and we don't. In fact, we've just scratched the surface, and, and that's thus the title, The Beginning of Infinity, because we're going to continue to have new knowledge, create new things, and, and pessimists sound smart, optimists make money. Right. So you've got uh, Malthus writing, oh, everyone's going to starve to death because we're going to have this population explosion and the food will run out. He was right about the population. He was totally wrong about the fact that we could figure out ways to 100x farm output. Right. So so always I'm thinking, well, yeah, but that hasn't been invented yet. So let me look around for the people who might be inventing things like that. Uh, the second thing is this idea of anything that does not violate the laws of physics is possible. And I'm a huge science fiction fan. And like, I love that aspect of it as well. Harry Seldon, one of, I love this, that whole series and everything. And, you know, I, <laughs> I kind of model myself on Harry Seldon because essentially we, we do, that's what we do. Yeah. We do huge samples now I have machine learning that I can use. And the thing you need to understand, and it actually Selden says it, I can't make a prediction on you or on Vatzel. I can, I'm getting much better at developing systems and tools that allows me to make predictions on broad trends, on where things are going. Now, am I gonna be wrong a lot? Sure, absolutely. And, but you've gotta take that feedback and and continually upgrade and update. So mm -hmm. I I also love what you highlight in in your book about kind of build as little as possible and outsource the rest. Um, do, do, do you see a time when this all becomes kind of like basically when it, I was my wife was asking me about you and I told her I was really excited for this podcast and and I'm and I and she goes, okay, shorthand, give me shorthand. And I said, okay, you know how I always talk about that the the way you're gonna win is to play a really long game with positive sum outcomes. And to me, that's what you are doing. Am I do I have that right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I I think generally you you if you're willing to to stick around, um, you know, I had a tweet the other day that was something like, you know, most people don't start, most people who start don't, con you know, don't continue. Yeah, I saw people. that. I wrote it yeah. down actually. Yeah. And it's like, it's so true. Like I've seen so many people. I remember talking to Ben from Pinterest about this when I was an early employee there. And I asked him like, what, you know, you, you know, it was his third or fourth startup. And it was like, what, you know, what separates like the people who succeed and the people who fail. And he, he had a really simple like answer which was like well the only thing that the people who fail have in common is that they gave up like everybody yep. inherently i mean everything else is up for debate but like that's the one because if you didn't give up you're still you haven't chosen that bucket for yourself right um or i had heard someone else say which is like as long as you're trying you either will die in the in the process of trying which you'll feel good about because you won't know that you failed uh or you will eventually succeed. So as long as you keep trying, you should never, you'll, you never have to kind of admit that kind of failure state, right? Um, and I think that's totally true. I think you have to pick a super long-term game. Most people are not willing to, and this kind of goes back to what we were saying before, like 
it's not like hard necessarily. It's just that this is not what many people want. Pick a super long-term game, play pot, play it positive sum, and be super open and transparent. Collect feedback from the market. Uh, you know, ship quickly, ship early and often is what I say. Um, anytime you have something better than what the market has, like give it away to the market and, you know, kind of upgrade the operating system of the world. And get, you just literally just do it, like do that for five to 10 years. And like, you will almost inevitably, I think, bump into somebody, help somebody who can 10 X you, right? Like for me, that might've been Ben from Pinterest or like Naval from AngelList with my rolling fund or whatever, but just that all just came from building stuff, putting it out into the world, genuinely trying to like improve the, the, the system, uh, just like an ant may and like an ant, ant colony, right? Very bottoms up and being like, hey, you did that. Like you deserve a promotion. Like, can you help us with this other problem? We have this much larger problem over here, right? Um, and people are watching. I think this is kind of people, I don't know, get sometimes upset when I say the internet has made it, you know, turned all these reasons into excuses, like lack of connections is now an excuse. You know, having no time is an excuse. It's like imposter syndrome is an excuse. Perfectionism is an excuse. Why? Because there's, you can see it all. You can literally see how these people who became these people became these people. Like literally it's like the sausage factory is in full view of anyone who wants, you know, you can read the Warren Buffett letters. You can read the, the Amazon, the Elon, like this is all in public, public domain. And what it means is one, like you'll get there. I think if you find success, but two, you almost need the time. Like you can't short. And this is something I think I mistake. I think I made in the early days of Gumroad is I felt like, Oh, if I worked harder, faster, you know, these are just a bunch of bits floating around. Like I can make this happen 10 times faster or hundred times faster. And I remember the projections for the company were something like 10 million in revenue the first year, and then $400 million in revenue the second year, like, or GMV or something like some stupid number looking back into it, because I really believe that the bottleneck was like the speed of light effectively. Right. And once I built this thing, it would, take over. But the truth is people almost need to the see that you've been around, right? Because why would you make a bet? Like you kind of want everyone to take a sip before you take a sip. And then you want to wait five minutes, right? Like, okay, no one died. I'll take a sip now. And it's kind of the same with startups, like, or Elon, like any of these things, businesses, it's just kind of like the Lindy effect, right? Like the longer it's been around, the longer it will be around. Right. Um, and I, I often think about this with humanity. Like it gets me very, you know, some people are like, Oh, we're at the edge. We're going to die like peak oil, right. <laughs> or like climate change or whatever. And it's like, people have been saying that since pro I assume since the beginning, right? Like, yes. Yes, they have. If we've, if we're here, even if we're not at the beginning of infinity, let's say we're at the beginning of a bell curve that we're just about to hit the peak of. And then we still have like effectively two X the amount of time to go, right. Just based on the drawing out the curve. And so we must have, I don't know, there's stuff coming. And I assume it's not going to be just like an iPhone 15, it's going to be like some crazy, just, you know, just like no one could have predicted the iPhone like 15, 20 years ago. Um, that's the other lesson I think I, I got from the beginning of infinity that I thought was super important is that we're not just slightly smarter monkeys, right? We are truly a different kind of step function change on what came before us. Right. And we're kind of, I think he calls them kind of like universal explainers or and connectors, universal yeah. explainers and connectors. And exactly. that's what we are. Homo sapien sapien, really smart man. And yeah. I've kind of, I kind of had a theory. Uh, I, I told her I keep uh, journals. Like, so I was reading one from like 1983 and it was all about my feelings about where computers were going. And, and like, I was speculating, okay, so the next evolution is going to be what I called silly name, but micro man. And here's Elon with the neural link. <laughs> so, so I, I, I get like super excited about all this stuff. I, I am like, just, I'm rational in my optimism. I, I understand that we're going to have all sorts of new problems. And, you know, like Bucky Fuller said, you, you don't change a system with the, with the problems that got you there. You create a new and better system. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and so I constantly have to remind myself, though, that like my son calls me a cohort of one. He's like, Dad, pe people don't think like that. <laughs> and he goes, you do sound a little batshit crazy sometimes when you're talking about all this great stuff that come down the road. I am not at all delusional that there's going to be serious, serious problems. But mm -hmm. 
you know, I am long human ingenuity. Mm -hmm. And and it, as you put it, peak oil. It, you know, they, they just uncovered like one of the earliest known texts found. And it was Sumerian. And they're dating it to about 3000 BC. And you know what it was when they translated it? It was a poet complaining about the fact that all the earlier poets had taken all the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Switching gears a bit, you mentioned Web3 and Metaverse, and apparently everyone has a different definition of what that is, which is, I guess, fine because it's so early that we don't really know what Web3 is actually going to be. So maybe what is Web3 to you? What is the Metaverse or whatever you want to call it? What is it to you? And how do you see it changing the world in some big ways, let's say in the next decade? Yeah, totally. So I think when I say Web3 or the metaverse or crypto, I think we're all kind of saying roughly the same thing, which is, which really started with Bitcoin, right? I, I, in sort of 2007 or 2008 or something like that. Um, and then Ethereum and, and, and some, other, some other projects. But I think basically the way that I think about it is on chain. Like I, I like using, it's either on chain or it's off chain. And if it's off chain, it's not part of the metaverse. It's part of the internet or, or the fabric of reality or any of these things, but it's not part of like, when I say web three, I'm kind of really referring to like on chain. And the, the, the reason that on chain is so interesting, right. And the, the sort of origin of, of Bitcoin was the solution to the Byzantine generals problem, right. Which is basically this idea that, there was no real way before that to coordinate in a way that like you could really in a trustless fashion, right? Like if you were, had to rely on, on people sending messages from each other, you know, to kind of coordinate an invasion of a town, like the people could always manipulate the message and the solution that sort of Bitcoin very cleverly came up with uh, or Satoshi Nakamoto or, or, or what have you is that effectively you just expend energy and that energy, everyone has to kind of expend the same energy at the same time to get to, and the, and it's kind of, probabilistic of the person who's going to get it right. And that person gets to decide what the truth is. And mm -hmm. it kind of basically costs a lot of money to send a message. And like Hashcash tried this with spam before, before Bitcoin email spam was kind of another thing. Like what happens when you make it free to effectively send mail to everybody, you get a ton of spam. Like, how do you deal with that? Well, maybe there's a cost. It turned out it was not the right solution. The right solution was these centralized spam filters. Um, but I think that this, I think that started this whole thing, right? And I often think about that as an investor is like, what are the trillion dollar problems? Like the Byzantine generals problem, um, the double spend problem, right? Like what are these problems and that, that are clearly worth trillions of dollars because we've had to like build systems around them, right? Like the entire financial industry or, or what have you. Uh, and so if you can solve this problem, then that's going to be a shuffling, as you mentioned, a reshuffling of a trillion dollars of, of, of value. And, and if you believe in sort of stochasticity, then maybe a 10 trillion, 100 trillion, like who knows what the real order of sort of impact of these things can be. I think it's very hard to hard to kind of predict. And I think NFTs have kind of, and Ethereum have kind of solved their own sets of, of, of problems. And like provenance, I think is a really great one. But yeah, when I, when I refer to it, I, I, I really think of basically there's no centralized authority, right? It's not like one person gets to print all the money in the system. It's that everyone can kind of collectively, it's kind of the truest democracy there is, which I think, you know, people can argue against, right? It's effectively saying one dollar, one vote, right? Which is maybe not what you would want in America. Like we have a communist voting system in a sense. And I think we, we probably want to keep that. Um, but, you know, and, and, and yeah. And, and the, the way that I think it, it changes things, um, one is I think it, it will eventually move us away from sort of the macroeconomic system that we have today, right? Like just the basically quantitative easing, like the ability to kind of like tax and subsidize certain kinds of behaviors uh, will just not be possible. It just will not be possible. The market, it's, it's basically like if you took the stock market and you said there are no, there are basically the, there are no limits, like you can do whatever you want. It's open all the time. The stock market can go to zero tomorrow. No one can say, and you know, any trade is valid if there's a buyer and a seller on either side, you know, and, um, and I actually think that would be great. It would be very volatile. Right. Uh, but I do think long-term it's going to lead, it would lead to sort of, you know, the survival of, of the fittest in, in, in a sense. Um, and so I think one, it's just going to lead to better products and services, right. Just kind of like how Amazon, I think really pioneered this like insane customer centricity that has like obviously worked for them. 
I think everyone is going to be forced to do, to take that view of, of things over time. Like my margin is your opportunity. I also think about one thing I've thought quite a lot about is how some of these companies in the beginning solve a real problem, are super innovative, build new technology. Over time, they basically become the incumbent, they become the rails, they become the protocol. Uh, Visa might be an example of this, right? Where they're kind of almost like a 3% tax on the, the economy, the credit kind of economy. Um, and I wonder if like maybe the answer is not necessarily that we kill Visa or like break it up or what have you, um, like people talk about, but more like we just, it transitions into a protocol an open source sort of publicly owned utility, right? But instead of sort of this socialism that, uh, you know, that might bring up, it's more like a decentralized, you know, sort of a layer two or layer one on, you know, in kind of crypto land, right? Uh, Web3, et cetera. Um, I think it has a lot of implications for like pseudonymity. It, you know, it, it allows for anyone to effectively uh, have a wallet. Um, if you have a wallet, then you don't need banks, right? Like what does a bank do? It stores your money for you, right? That's kind of like the fundamental thing that it does that, and then all these other things they do kind of come on top of that, right? Um, but if you have, if you own your money, if you if you own your wallet, it's on your computer or in your house, um, it's sort of a custodial, then like, or non-custodial, then why, you know, that, that requires like a total reshift. One, anyone can participate in it. Two, anyone can become, provide those services. Like it doesn't have to be the bank that provides those services to its customers. It can be anyone else, which is where the whole kind of DeFi comes from. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really interesting is these sort of, these permissionless, trustless uh, sort of smart contracts, right? And I, I think this is really important because I think ultimately, if you want people to work together, they're just not like getting a diverse set of people to agree on the same thing is just virtually impossible. And this was not maybe a problem. And I noticed this actually in Provo, Utah, where it's actually the government is a lot more efficient, but one of the reasons it's more efficient or kind of like the left kind of critique of it would be, well, it's a lot less diverse. So it's like a lot easier to get everyone aligned on something if everyone is kind of the same, right? Like it's kind of like you go to a dinner and everyone gets a steak, it's easy to split the bill. But if one friend goes all out, you're like, well, what? You're, you know, like, I don't, you know, we all got to pay for ourselves now, right? And so I think the answer is not, oh, we need to figure out how to get everyone to trust each other. I think the answer is how do we have collective action without needing to trust each other, without saying, for example, like I had this thought recently, why do we have political parties, right? We have political parties because the kind of running for office independently did made no sense like 50 or 100 years ago. You needed the infrastructure, right? And so you had the parties and then you had the politicians, and then the politicians have proposals and the Congress, I think they, they kind of like they're 90% of the value they have. It's like one bill a year, right? Like this massive spending bill, right? Um, and I was thinking like, well, why, why don't we just vote on the bill? Why do we like, if that's the value of, you know, if that's becoming like the majority of what they're doing, because it kind of has to be, because there's just, there's no way to, you know, there's kind of like one block gets mined. Everyone has to have, get consensus on this one thing. It's super hard and difficult, but then it's like, well, why don't, why doesn't everyone just submit a bill and then we all just vote on which bill, you know, who we spend money on, which is effectively what a DAO does. Like all a DAO does, like I had a hard time wrapping my head around, what does a DAO do? Like, how do you get all of this stuff on chain? Like I run a company, there's no way you can bring all of this on chain. And then I realized like a DAO is actually really simple. It, it's, a, it's not really a, it's just a treasury. All it does is have money get sent to it either via smart contract or, or contributors. Uh, and then all it does is people vote on who to give that money to. And that's as simple as how much and to whom, which wallet, that, that's it. And if you think about it, like that's kind of what the government does, right? Like you just like, how much money do we print and who gets it, right? And 2 billion for tree equity or whatever, right? Like, but like there should be a tree equity wallet, you know, that's like tied to some organization that does this. And then anyone can, can you know, and I, I, I was like, wait a second, like, Maybe we don't need parties. Maybe we don't even need politicians. Like everyone's been focused on, we don't need parties anymore. But I was like, well, maybe we don't, we don't even need politicians because all the politicians do is we have to trust them. And then we hope that they do what, you know, they, they have a bill that supports the things that I want, you know, they, they ran on or what have you. And then obviously that like never happens, right? Like there's all these things that, you know, and excuses and, you know, consensus that you need and, and all these things, right? Um, but like, what if I could just vote on a bill, you know? Um, and, you know, like it has allocations for this and that, and I, you know, and, and I don't need these other middle layers in between me and them. And so I, I think like the, the, 
the largest thing, the kind of the largest target, the thing that has the largest target on its back, I guess, is the federal government of the United States, right? It's like the largest employer on planet earth. It's like, if, if you have one customer, I mean, that is the TAM, right? If you care about TAM, like TAM, <laughs> right. the US government. Um, and so I actually think ultimately like the, the, the final boss of web three and crypto and decentralization is, is the United States federal government. Like ultimately it's going to have to kind of subsume that, which is maybe why they're so resistant is they kind of detect that this thing is really kind of, it's kind of a innovator's dilemma. Um, but I really believe that that's where the, where we're going. Right. Because right now we, we end up with this huge, and I often think about kind of the Ben Thompson unbundling and bundling. Right. Um, but I often think about, you know, you, you, you basically cast one vote and that is an insane bundle of things that you get for that one vote. And then all of a sudden the person that wins is like, Hey, look, we have the mandate from the people to do all of these things. And it's like, not really. You have this incredibly blended mandate and you actually only have a 51% mandate. So like most people don't like this and you don't know, like on, you know, on taxes, people might've wanted this kind of president on climate change. Someone might've want these, the, you know, this person might've won on, you know, trans literally all the cabinet members is an easy list of all the different potential, you know, slider scales that you would have, right? Um, but if that's the case, then like, why don't we just vote for those? Like, you know, and obviously, you know, more, uh, this is why I think the sovereign individual is so interesting. And I think the way, the ultimate power the federal government has and all these nation states have in terms of their preservation is violence, right? Yes. Is, is basically they provide security and safety um, or, you know, theorize that they do. And, you know, kind of the state has monopoly and violence and, and like you're, that is the, like, I actually really believe that one of the, like, just like we need self-driving cars for certain things to happen. Um, I really believe that one of the technological pieces that we have to figure out is how do we reduce basically violence to a zero, right? Uh, because imagine, imagine a world in which you had zero threat of violence. How amazing would that world be? How much money would we save? You know, how much money gets spent on defense, quote unquote? I, I know, you know, running Gumroad, most of the code is defense. It's like click fraud. It's forget password stuff. If like, imagine if you could just log into Gumroad by like typing in your name and we just trusted you. If we had full trust, right? It, our code would be a, a, a 1% of the code because we wouldn't have to test for all the, 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 the bad cases. Oh, that's how much money you say you have? Cool. We trust you, right? Um, but that's what crypto is. Crypto, basically you do, you do the trust thing at the gate it, you kind of transition into it and you have kind of this trustless economy and then boom, you don't have reset your password. That doesn't exist in crypto. You know, you don't have KYC. You don't have any of these things. You just assume uh, you don't, it, it's, it's better than trust. It's trustless, you know? Um, and so anyway, I think that's where a lot of the world goes and where I would love for Gummer to go eventually is this, these ideas. Like as a CEO, why do I get to make certain decisions, right? Like, why can't I outsource them? Just like we talked a little bit, you know, build as little as possible. Like my goal is to like excommunicate myself, right? From the head of this religion. And like, how do I do that? It's like give power to the people. And how do, right now the technological infrastructure, everyone would need crypto. Like it's, we're not there yet. Um, but certainly the writing to me is kind of on the wall, which is like, yeah, at some point in the future, uh, you know, I'm going to be able to delegate my votes to somebody else and they're going to be able to decide you know, the, the fate of, of this system, um, it's going to take a lot to get there. But I, I do think that just generally is kind of, you know, power corrupts kind of absolutely. And, and the answer is to not hire, like not put a smart people or amazing people in power because those people don't want to be there anyway. It's to like reduce the power and like just make it so that, you know, Naval has this great saying, which is, you know, if you want to sort of vet a system, you, you want to put your enemy in, you know, you, you want a system in which you would be comfortable with your enemy at the front, right? Um, so only make things legal or illegal if you, you know, if your enemy was in the front seat of the car. Um, and I think I think that's a really good test. It's like you you ultimately want a system that you trust, and the best way to trust it is that you don't need to, you don't have, you know, there's no threat on you. Um, so I think I think we'll get there, and I, I think we're already actually there in a sense. Like I don't think we'll ever have a World War Three. I think the internet makes it virtually impossible to go to war. Because the, the sort of dehumanization you needed to be able to do, the propaganda, you're just, there's like TikTok. I mean, I'm sorry, but like, you're not going to think that these people are evil. We all know that, you know, most people are not. Maybe there's a few monsters out there, um, but it's just like a, it's just a telephone game gone wrong, right? Like that's what most, I think, conflicts are. And 
the solution is kind of sunlight is the best dis disinfectant, every, you know, open source everything. And by the way, you can still print money. Like the government can still in this totally new world print money. It just has to be a collective decision to print money. And then certainly you can. Um, but my guess is, you know, it's not going to happen. Like you're, you're going to move past this point and it's going to hurt. It's going to suck when an airline goes bankrupt and it just goes bankrupt. Actually, there's no and <laughs> like that's just the end of it. Um, and, you know, I, and I, I often think about this with the kind of the Peter Thielian the kind of model, which is like it is it is harmful in the sense that like it's a lot more destructive. Like there's a lot of things that will kind of die. Right. It is sort of this process of evolution. Like nature is metal. It's not pretty to watch it play out. But I do think it, it gets us into a better future faster, like that level of competition. Like, and that's just what I end up caring more about, right? Is I just care more about getting to that 10, 15. And maybe that's just me from a position of privilege, knowing that if the world goes to crap, I can hide in an ivory tower somewhere or something like that. Um, but I just really want the future to improve at a faster rate. And I believe the way you have that happen is you just reduce you know, the barriers to competition. You, you kind of make it a free for all. Um, and then you kind of see what happens. So, so in today's news, and this isn't official yet, so I hope I'm wrong, but uh, apparently the Indian government will make it illegal to hold crypto assets in a private wallet. So I'm, I'm thinking if the governments realize that the end game of crypto can be an existential threat to them, what if they come, start coming up with policies like this? which disincentivize the public because of course they have the army and the military and in turn that in turn becomes an existential threat to crypto because before it can actually become an, an existential threat to the governments can the yeah government of possibility of something like that yeah i mean it's gonna happen right like if it truly is an existential threat then like yes like the you know china india the us um, just like, you know, often the innovation doesn't come from like the electric car didn't come from Ford or GM, right? It came from Tesla and like, thank God it's an American company, right? But, you know, we kind of got lucky, I think on that one in a sense. Um, a great example of like probabilistic versus deterministic. It's very easy to think, oh, obviously, but it's like no one thought America would be the leading car automaker in 2021 or had the chance to, right? That was, that was Asia's game, right? Uh, yep. Right. Totally shocking to, to, the, to the world. Um, but yeah, it'll happen. And I, I think ultimately what you'll see is you'll see kind of like what's happening in El Salvador, uh, maybe what's happening in, Port in Port 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 Portugal or Singapore, where new smaller countries who have less to lose and more to gain that will be willing to take these sorts of bets because it is a bet. It is a bet that a startup will make, not an established company will make. Um, I think there are a lot of interesting ideas around charter cities like Prospera and Honduras and like other things like that, that I think may, you know, al allow this to, to happen. But ultimately, I think the big companies in this case will lose because it's so much easier to exit, right? Like I could move to the Cayman Islands in like three months and like, they're happy to have me, you know, they're happy to be, be, and if, and it goes back to that question of violence, like, will you know, will these countries do something about it? Will these people try to get the money, you know, claw the money back or, or what have you, like California, you know, they kind of rumor to do this, right? Where it's like, well, if, if you start a company in California and then before it IPOs, you move to Florida, we're going to try to get that, you know, a good chunk of that. Um, the value was created in, you know, on our land. But like the more mobile people get, which is only going to happen more and more and more, effectively, like the lowest tax rate is the tax rate, right? Because, just like companies have to compete now cities and countries are going to have to compete more, you know, coming out of COVID is going to get Portugal is going to offer this and Thailand's going to offer that and Singapore is going to offer this and New Zealand's going to offer that. And if they can get a critical mass of just a few people to move to a certain place and put it on the map, like imagine if Elon moved to, you know, a, a, I don't know, Bhutan or something like that, like it would boom, Bhutan's on the map, you know, uh, and I think that's going to, you know, and, and the U.S. is really the only country, I believe, in the world that like taxes its citizens, no matter where they live, basically. We are. Like, yeah. You know, Puerto Rico or something like that. But like basically like it, which is like what a crazy, like crazy thing. So no, no country can even play the game that we get to play. Like it's kind of a singular game. But even that, like I think over time, like people will renounce their U.S. citizenships and like will move. And if the threat of violence is gone, which eventually like. Do we really believe that the U.S. is going to invade a country? Like, I just don't think we're going to get the, the popular consent to do something like that, uh, the common consent. Like, I think 
And it's going to be, it's going to be very, I actually think that's going to be in terms of remote work and the way that Gumroad operates, we have people in 17 different countries. Um, I think that's going to be one of the big questions, which is like, how do you deal with, you know, for example, like the EU had to do, you know, a VAT, right? Australia is doing something similar. Some US states are doing something similar. Why? Because they're, they're noticing that like all of these kind of flow of funds are changing and it's not just, it's not as simple as it used to be, right? And what happens when you have all of these people who are like getting paid in crypto, um, and it's just, it's, I don't think anyone has the answers to this, to be honest. I mean, this is like the beauty of reality is you just, it is probabilistic, right? So like, we just have to play it out and like, we'll see kind of what ends up happening. And maybe the answer is, you know, it's, it's the null set, right? Like the future is the null set, right? Basically, like, we're not going to get there. Um, it's not written in some book, right? Um, or some, some Marty Carlo situation or, or something like that scenario. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's like, that's, even like I was thinking about this pre-COVID where I was like, wow, I was like, what if I got a, a car and just drove around the US and worked on Gumroad? Like, how do I, you know, and this is by the way, a question like self-driving cars. Like once you have a self-driving car, then all of a sudden you're gonna have a self-driving house. And once you have a self-driving house, how do you, where do you pay taxes? Like what if I work, you know, in a beautiful place and then I go to sleep and I wake up in, you know, Florida or Washington, right? And like, I, I, I sleep in 0% tax, you know, income tax place states and, you know, and. It, and NBA players had to figure this out, right? They play games in a bunch of different states and they have to pay taxes in, you know, all the states that they play and they can't really get away with it because it, there's a paper trail of them playing in all of these different places and they've established sort of the methodology and the kind of the precedent of how this kind of works. Um, and so my guess is like, imagine everyone or like 30% of the population or 10% of the population even, or 1% of the population, like the infrastructure you know, to support that, like just the million dollar accountant that the, an NBA player or team may have to help them with this, we're all going to need, right? It's going to be a lot more sort of dissipated, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, it's, it's, and I, I really think to me, like self-driving cars was actually going to be the technology that was going to sort of lead to all of this political regulatory changes. And it's kind of funny because actually self-driving has taken a lot longer than we thought, speaking to the probabilistic nature of things. Like I thought self-driving cars and then AR, VR, and then crypto, and then remote work. And then it, it's like, nope, it turns out it's like self-driving cars is like three years out, maybe, I don't know. Crypto is happening now. Remote work just happened. The order is 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 kind of, is is different, but, um, but they all lead to the same future, which is like the sovereign individual, everyone for themselves. Um, you know, hopefully that that's a world of like uber transparency. No one can choose to print more money more than anybody else can. And you have the ability to see what's happening, right? Like, I believe all taxes should be real time uh, or pseudo real time. Like maybe you get the money, but like it's, it's automatically gonna get withdrawn from your account after a year or something like that. But like when I make, you know, when Gumroad sends me a paycheck, just like they take money out for social and for other things, like they should just do, everything should just done. Like, why do I pay taxes at the end of the year? The IRS already knows how much they, I owe them, like to tell me, right? Just just send me a bill, send me an invoice. Um, but I, ideally, you know, every receipt should have a list of those things. And that list should not be like one item to the federal government. It should be, or the state or what have you, it should be like, you know, four cents went to this thing and like eight cents went to SpaceX through this subsidy that we have. Like, and this data is there, like this has happened, right? Uh, this is already happening. It's just super opaque. It's on pen and paper. Um, it's, and I, I can't wait until all of that stuff is, I can write a SQL query and just do some math on my own taxes. How much did Sahil earn in the last six years and how much of that went to uh, tree equity, right? Um, I wanna know, I wanna put that as a badge on my Facebook account, right? Yeah. Um, or I wanna, you know, I want, I wanna open a coffee shop and say, if you've done this, if you've contributed this much to this, these sets of things, you know, you get a dollar off. Like the, the composability of this, like when, when, when you can start to do all of these kinds of things, obviously opt in on it, you know, everyone's going to choose to have their data as part of these things. I'm pretty optimistic that, that these things will happen. And one of the amazing things about crypto is kind of the zero knowledge proof, you know, pri privacy sort of things that you'll get that you don't currently have in today, um, sort of today's society even, or you have it through very weird arbitrary things like HIPAA compliance and, and things like that. Um, but that, that's going to be like an incredibly exciting world. Right. Like imagine I launch a new startup and I say, oh, everyone who's made a bit of, you know, who's made at least a dollar on Gumroad gets early access to this. Like the composability to do that is just not there today. Right. Um, and certainly it's not there for a non-technical person. Right. Um, but it will be 
like I'm, you know, the laws of physics say it will be. So I have faith in, in that. So it's very exciting. I, I uh, completely agree with you and could go on for another two hours to, because uh, you are very compelling and, and I love hearing it. I just, uh, it's the right way to look at things in my opinion. Probably wrong. I'm probably wrong. <laughs> but, well, the good news is if you're wrong, like people will be distracted with the world being on fire anyway. Right? Exactly. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Well, this has been incredibly fun. Um, at the end of each one of these, uh, we, we ask a question that is kind of fun to me, at least, because it kind of shows you, you know, what, what is really important to the guest. And, and so the, the question we ask is this, uh, we're going to wave a wand and make you the emperor of the world for one day. Uh, you can't kill anybody. You can't put anyone in a re-education camp. But what you can do is incept them. You can, you can put an, you know, uh, what does uh, Doug Adams call it? An ear frog or an, uh, an earwig. Uh, in, in, and they're going to wake up the next morning and they're going to have two ideas that they thought they came up with that further to our earlier part of the conversation, they're gonna act on. They're not mm. just gonna be lovely ideas, but they're gonna wake up and think, you know what, I'm gonna, what two things you got for me? Yeah, De well, I think the, fir the first one is almost definitely that the, that software is just as important to the evolution of humanity as writing was, right? So just like we went from oral tradition to writing tradition, I think writing tradition to software, like I think software is just as big a deal of that in terms of like a positive sum game. Um, it's just absolutely incredible. And so I think anyone who can be like, okay, I need to use software in my future. Like I need to basically make, you know, my, my life needs to rely on software. Either, you know, you, you are the, the one who gets to use software to eat the world, or you're the one the ones that gets eaten by the people who get to use software to eat the world. Um, I think that's like a really, really uh, important idea um, and maybe thinking when we have Neuralink will be like the next level of that, right? Where we can start beaming thoughts into each other and like, who knows, like the highest, uh, the fidelity we're missing on when we're trying to communicate, it might be an order of magnitude or more, right? That, that it'll be very interesting to see that. So that's one. Um, and then two really simple is capitalism is really awesome. Like, I, I think, <laughs> I think capitalism is like a dirty word. It's a four letter word. Many people don't like when I say the word even, um, even though they know what I'm referring to, it's like almost become like a triggering in a sense. But I really believe that like capitalism and this kind of weighing scale, it leads to like the best possible future for everybody. And it's kind of undeniable to me. And, you know, I've read the books like The Rational Optimist you kind of mentioned or alluded to Steven Pinker's stuff. Like I see it. I see the world getting better and better and better. Um, but that requires people to start companies, raise capital, hire people, you know, organize. Um, and it's, it's, and yeah, it's, it's a ton of work and it's, it's unfortunately going to lead to billionaires and trillionaires. And uh, that's not because they're evil or because there's a ton of corruption. It's just because we literally choose to give them the money. Like that's right. That's literally what we did. We said, we prefer that Bezos spend our money and, Elon's better money than, than us. Like they're good at that. Like, let's let them do that. And I think I'd like to think that 2020 has shown people how essential that is. It's how awesome entrepreneurs and startups really are. Um, and I think it's very early days. Um, and so, yeah, I would say capitalism and software and the combination of the two, like if you can just think about those two things and figure out how you can apply those two things into your life, like I think you'll you'll be happier. And a lot of this just comes down to that. You'll be more free and you'll be happier. You'll feel, you'll have a higher, you know, a larger impact on society. Society will have a, le a smaller impact on you. you. You will feel less controlled by it. Um, and yeah, you'll just, you'll just be a happier, healthier person. I think. I love it. I love it. Thank you for being on the show. It, one final thought. Um, I love that idea about capitalism. I've always been a big believer in free markets because Evidence, man. Let's just look at the evidence. And the evidence is so overwhelmingly in favor of free markets and free minds and free people. Uh, they, they do amazing things. And, and you know, I just shake my head. I, I sometimes joke on uh, social media like, uh, capitalism sucks. He tweeted 
from his iPhone at Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. You live in a society or something, you know. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, but, you know, five, uh, I, I have said that kind of thing all, all along and I've noticed a change. Five years ago, me saying things like you just said, like people my age would like look at me like, you're crazy, man. Now I'm saying it and they're like, yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. So it's one of these, those things, you know, we evolve. I, what you say about uh, the evolution of software, you're absolutely right. We have been much more affected by our aggregate social evolution, in my opinion, than we have even from the mother evolution, right? The, the written word changed the shape of our brains. Uh, we're being rewired as we speak by these uh, devices. We're carrying, you know, supercomputers in our pocket and they're rewiring our brains. And like some people like, oh, that's awful. No, it's not. It's yeah. like, it's the future and it's going to be a better place. Yeah, and, and not to let this run on too long, but you know, there was a big thing in the last couple of years about how like everyone was addicted to social media and it was like the worst thing on, on, the, on planet earth and all these kids were gonna get ruined by it. And I had a, in, an inkling, I was like, the human brain and body is more adaptive than we, like then we often give it, give it credit for. Like it's unlikely that we made it this far. And then in like two years, we all <laughs> left up, you know, like if we don't have cancer from these phones, like, I don't know, we, we seem to be pretty darn resilient. And it turns out in the last like six months or so, there's been a lot of these studies coming out that, and, and basically everybody knows this, like none of us are really addicted to our phones. Like it's just, no. we are when we're at home and there's nothing else to do and there's a pandemic, but like, actually, if you're having dinner with friends or whatever, like, no, it's not, it's not a drug. It's not, really not. And yeah, that just gives me gives me a lot of confidence that like we're we're kind of over indexing and like, maybe you should right the, sort of the mother evolution as you said like encourages that right because the downside is you know you get eaten by a lion right that kind of <laughs> you want to really prevent that but if if the downside is is much more mitigated in, in reality then you know yeah you should be much more comfortable taking risks um, because the risk is really just like oh you I don't know had a tweet that didn't resonate with people or <laughs> like it's not not the same as it used to be but I. I really believe that like technology, I think we're constantly realizing like technology has a lot of benefits, more benefits than we think, and even has fewer downsides than we think, because the human brain is pretty good at picking and choosing, you know, and uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's worked, it's worked out so far. It's the same thing with America. Like people have, I don't know, crapped on America for forever. It seems like, I don't know, seems like we still have it. Um, I don't know. It, you know, we've been lucky like 10 times in a row at this point. <laughs> Maybe yeah. there's something deeper. There might be something deeper. All right, this has been fantastic. Really great. Thank you for being on. This is gonna be awesome. You're welcome.